There are more than 100 unique styles of beer, each with their own set of ingredients, process, guidelines, history, and experience. If you're a beer lover, an industry leader, or somewhere in between, a better knowledge of beer style will improve your life and your work. Welcome to A Sense of Beer Style, essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. I'm Julia Herz. And I'm Jeremy Storden. We're advanced Cicerones, beer judges, home brewers, and we're excited to guide you through the vast and wonderful world of beer styles. All right, Jeremy, and listeners and watchers of Sense of Beer Style, pay attention and listen to that sound. And the style that we're talking about today, part of, right, American Pale American Ale is American Pale Ale. And and hey, by the way, I just opened a can of it from the brewery that helped put it on the map, but it didn't even start in a can. It started in a keg and then to bottles, but I don't care because it's so awesome in the can. Um, and I'm being a little flippant, but hey, you got to have fun. It's just beer. So let's have some fun with it. And frankly, hats off to you each that are taking the time to study and, and talk styles with us in this style cast with me and Jeremy, because you need to know if you are into beer, you need to own American Pale Ale. I myself, fine friends, have failed the test in blind tasting situations when sitting for certified Cicerone to identify American Pale Ale as Sierra Nevada. Wow. How did I do that? Because I obviously wasn't calibrating enough. Mm -hmm. So that means buy some today, keep buying it, always have American Pale Ale in your fridge, and give yourself this kind of Average strength, more hop forward, you know, pale American beer, a uh, a week in and week out uh, opportunity to be appreciated because boy, is this style great. And I think real quick before we get Jeremy to take us through the ingredients, you know, this really stemmed from English ales and the Americans trying to do their own thing. Yes, that happens. Uh, and then it was the precursor to American IPA. And now if you look at the whole craft beer movement globally, uh, who'd have thunk that compared to the, you know, the domestic and mass produced lagers, that the anti-style to that, that would be the top selling anti-style, would be something so happy as IPA. But without pale ale and then without English pales before that, we wouldn't have found our way to IPA. So yeah. it's, it's a super fun one to talk about and, and get to know. And, and I'm, I'm super excited about this style cast. Uh, you know, the, this style uh, was the dominant craft beer style for decades until IPAs took over. And now it's become somewhat mundane, but there's nothing mundane about the story of this beer. Um, and before I dive into the ingredients, one of the stories I love about this beer, particularly having lived in Oregon for almost 20 years, uh, you know, when, when Ken Grossman uh, took the, the British pale ale and, and tried to tweak it and make it his own, it essentially in, invent the American pale ale style. The, one of the stories I've heard from very good uh, uh, first account uh, folks is uh, Oregon State University, OSU up in Corvallis, uh, Oregon, obviously, uh, has had a hop, uh, uh, a hop breeding program since the 1930s. And uh, in the 60s, 70s, they were working on different hops to compete with the German noble hops. And they had a bunch of hops that didn't quite uh, work out quite so well. They were not up to that German noble hop standard. So they were considered failures. Uh, and Ken Grossman opens up here in Nevada in 1979. He goes up to OSU, says, what kind of hops do you have that I can work with? And they say, well, you know, basically, you know, this, the, the short version of the story is here. Try this one. And, and so he tried it in that, that hop, uh, is the cascade hop, uh, that the, the quote unquote, the failure hop is really what gave American craft beer, its flavor profile, its, its identity. And that, that hop up until recently was the most uh, popular hop that went around the world to use in craft beer. Uh, and Jeremy, I want to add something. You're on a roll, yeah, but if, it. if it's okay to jump in. You just brought us to the fact that nothing's guaranteed. I need to point that out. Hops have a lifespan, mm -hmm. right? And we will see where the hop research can take us. But, you know, the Cascade hop that is, is American Pale Ale became known for that is used by Sierra Nevada is one of the classic examples that Jeremy's talking about the history for that. 
Um, on the flip side is it's now decades old yeah. and hops can become uh, no longer as resistant to uh, you know mold and mildew and mites and, and, and the like. So I would say keep your eye on how our um, our partners that bring us the agricultural products, the hops and the, and the barley and the like, can help keep Cascade around because it's not guaranteed to be resistant to what wants to get at certain hops forever. Yeah. And, and and I wanted to share that story for anyone listening or watching. I just wanted, I want you to appreciate the history, the impact that this beer style has made. Uh, this was, I don't want to say ground zero, but it was one of the early beer styles that really helped define American craft beer and now global craft beer. Um, so before I just go on and, uh, and over philosophize, let's talk about the ingredients that we would expect to see in a classic American pale ale. Um, the, uh, you know, these days, the BJCP 2021 guidelines calls it a neutral pale malt. Uh, I, I translate that into uh, a base uh, two row malt or a base pale malt. Uh, I would expect that to be an American pale ale malt because it's, you know, different uh, if it's uh, coming from England or Belgium or anything like that. Uh, so we just talked about how the, you know, the, the source beer that created the style was using the Cascade hop. These days, any hop can work, any American hop, any New World hop. Um, this pale ale that I'm, I'm drinking from uh, Pelican Brewing in Pacific City, Oregon, not far from uh, Corvallis. This does not taste like pine trees and, and grapefruit rind. This tastes like uh, tropical fruit and a little bit of a uh, forest pine. There's, there's, there's nothing that says you have to use this hop anymore. So, so, so give it some room when you're uh, studying this, when you're tasting it, um, when, when you're calibrating uh, again and again and again, uh, just understand that we're going to have different flavors come through this, but we need to, uh, coalesce all this information into uh, a sense of style, uh, pun intended. Um, when we get to the yeast, you can use American yeast. You can use English uh, ale yeast. Uh, American yeast is going to be a little bit more um, uh, neutral or very clean. And English ale yeast will have a little bit more fruity esters, maybe a little bit more diacetyl, maybe a little bit more honey, a little bit more uh, apple coming through in that. And that's, and that's all that is fine. Uh we, uh, the other thing that we expect to see, especially when you look at, uh, this color, uh, and for those of you listening, this is, uh, kind of on the light side of Amber, we're going to use that, uh, that two row pale malt, uh, and we're going to use some specialty malts, even some caramel malts, just to add a little color, a little bit of flavor, and just make it absolutely wonderful. Uh, this is what we expect, uh, from just the average American pale ale. Uh, so that is ingredients. Let's talk about appearance since we both have glasses in our hands. Yeah, and I have started drinking and and enjoying it already. I couldn't wait, couldn't wait till we got to flavor, right? <laughs> totally cloud. It's like a professional pursuit yes. of calibrating. Um, appearance pale golden to amber. I think that's very straightforward. Uh, we don't think that uh, um, it should be darker than that. Amber is not all the way to copper. And this Sierra Nevada Pale Ale is just that. It's darker than gold and it's not quite fully amber. So that's what I love. Yeah. Um, moderately large white collar of foam, off white, um, no doubt, by a sneak of uh, a little bit of specialty malt probably in the ingredients. So it's not going to be pure ivory white, but a, um, you know, uh, a, a collar of foam that we can see that we the that comes back when you swirl it around the glass for sure and so good good collar foam and retention is important um if things are too oily in the mix and a lot of heavy hands are being used with hops these days and hop oils um you're going to be able to tell so i don't want it so overly hopped that the oils in the hops affect the head retention and then quite clear i'm going to go as far to say that sierra nevada pushes the um the benchmark it's definitely not brilliant um, and I'm going to say it's not clear. It's just a touch hazy. And, and frankly, you know, Sierra Nevada in the can and in the bottle, they can condition and bottle condition. And so what that means is, is that the yeast is going to give us the carbonation. And so the appearance might appear uh, in the uh, not as fresh examples. And mine's fresh. It's within date range. But as it develops, that yeast 
is still giving eating a few sugars and giving us that carbonation. Um, so I'm going to say that that can conditioning is going to give us just a touch haze from that yeast that is in there. You can also get a little haze sometimes from hops. Um, so let's get to the aroma, Jeremy, because that's the good stuff. Yeah, and I think this was one of the original beers that turned us all into craft beer lovers. And these days, I would go so far as to say that it has become underrated. This is a, a beer that is perfectly balanced, but not, but but we're not muting, you know, the flavors. Both both the malt and the hops are prominent. Uh, for me, it's like you know Led Zeppelin. You've got a great singer, you got a great guitarist, you got a great bass player, you got a great drummer. Everything is great. That's what a pale ale is. Everything is great, and it's and it's, but it's in balance. The the malt in this, uh, I, I get a low to medium bready malt, but it but we're getting into it's it can be lightly toasty, can be uh, kind of pale and biscuity. I, I love that most of these pale ales have this beautiful light caramel malt that comes through. Sometimes I get these wonderful uh, uh, esters. You can it'd be low to medium esters, but uh, you can have these esters. Sometimes I get tangerine. Sometimes I get orange. Sometimes I get grapefruit. Sometimes I get a little bit of uh, uh, red apple, and it's just beautiful. The uh, the hops. This is a balanced beer, but if if anything, I would say it leans toward the hops just a little bit, so we can get medium to medium high hop flavor. It can be American hops. It can be New World uh, tropical hops. Uh, we're looking at flavors of like you know citrus. Grapefruit is the classic. Pine tree is the classic. Um, could be floral. Could be tropical. Could be stone fruit berries. All these things that you can get. It, it's all up for grabs, and it's all wonderful. Uh, I would. I do expect these to be dry hopped because uh, some some years ago we fell in love with dry hopping, and so you get this beautiful hop flavor and aroma. Uh, and of course, I'm talking about aroma right now. I'm supposed to be talking about just aroma, but I always put aroma and flavor together. So I'm I'm stealing a little bit of your thunder, Julia. Sorry about that. But but you get this beautiful uh, hop flavor and aroma just because they're dry hopping and they're adding that flavor and aroma at, at the very end of it. Um, that this is what I'm looking at when it comes to the aroma and and it, forgive me for stealing a little bit of flavor, but to me the, they kind of go hand in hand. But please, you're please. not stealing flavor. You're adding to the flavor. I'm, I'm adding to the aroma, uh, and, but I'll let you finish and, off with flavor. And it's a it's a great baton pass, Jeremy, because again, we're overviewing 2021 beer yeah. judge certification style guidelines. And one of the things it says in flavor is is fresh dry hop flavor optional. Yeah. Jeremy, though, I back what you're saying. You can't come across many examples of these that haven't been dry hopped. Yeah. Like that's kind of weird. So, you know, it's just that in the flavor. That's just un-American. If we are dry hopping, you might not get it as dominant. You are going to get from dry hopping much more essence of uh, the hops and the aroma. Let's quick do 101 hops. Hops bring so many things to beer. Uh, I won't go. We'll do a whole, uh, you know, prepisode on hops. But the fact that hops bring not just bitterness, but aroma and flavor, and are a preservative, and bring um, some visual aspect, and bring tannins. I mean, and I haven't even finished the list. It gets kind of complicated. So you want to remember that when a brewer is adding hops, there's something called isomerization of hop alpha acids. That has to do with heat being exposed to those hop alpha acids that then um, volatize out the um, terpenes and the essence of what would come through in the flavor and, and aroma um, more. And I think I need to backtrack here because actually the heat is going to give us the bitterness. That's the isomerization. But it's really hard to um, to get the aspect of hops these days in just bitterness. So it's going to sneak into the aroma. It's going to sneak into the flavor. But intentional, intentional adding of hops for aroma is that dry hopping or late in the boil, mm -hmm. less heat exposure, and then intentional um, addition of hop flavor with these cascade hops is the middle of the boil. You add your boiling hops um, in, in the beginning of the boil because you need the most amount of heat for the longest amount of time to extract or isomerize all that bitterness. Back to flavor. We have intentional addition, not just for Jeremy's aroma of those hops, but for flavor addition of these hops. And if you look at recipes, clone recipes for Sierra Nevada Pale Ale or any of the beers, Pelican or whatever, you're going to see that hops are added at multiple stages in the process. So flavor 
basically, this is a beer that should lean and tilt toward more hops, and the malt is a supporting star. It's not in the background, that malt, but it's a supporting star. And so I think that's really important because when I say hop, it doesn't mean bitterness always. It can sometimes mean flavor and bitterness or one or the other. So we want the pale ale to tilt toward hop flavor and bitterness, right? And that bitterness is moderate to high. And then we also want the essence of those hop varieties in flavor to be at least medium, if not high. Yeah. And so the only other thing that really we would want to drill down on is the malt character of typical American pale ale malt. Um, the style guidelines talk about caramel can be optional, uh, but you might get some caramel that it sneaks into. Also, as beers age, they're going to get more malty and less hoppy. And I see some of these kind of beers that are made with uh, general kind of uh, pale malts to go more towards honey as they get aged. So you might see some um, some honey in an aged one. And then the finish, the medium to dry finish that the style guidelines talk about. That's the quenching aspect of American pale ale. Um, medium to dry finish means medium dry, not sweet, right? Um, and dry means it could finish really dry. Like on my my tongue and soft palate as I drink this and talk, and I'm doing too much talking and not enough drinking, um, it, it, it lingers with some sense of bitterness and some sense of those cascade hops still giving me a little bit of the, the tropics, right? But I'm also getting this bite, this dryness, this refreshment, this, oh, wow, that beer kind of faded away and I don't have residual sugar still lingering. So that's a lot that covers most of the things um, on flavor. You can add anything or not, Jeremy, because no. we could wax poetic, write books, write essays, write rap songs on this entire well, style. And that's the thing. This beer style has had such an impact both flavor-wise, experience, experientially to the craft beer around the world and, and to obviously our lives because Julie and I are just as, as giddy as, you know, as – mice in a, in a cheese store, you know, it's, it's like, we, it's this just absolutely wonderful beer that, that, uh, used to have a lot of attention. It's not getting as much attention these days, but we really need to spend more time on this beer style. Um, so I'll, I'll talk about mouthfeel and we'll move on, but mouthfeel, um, this beer, uh, we can see, uh, it can be a medium light to medium body. It's not a heavy beer. It shouldn't be a heavy beer, but I will say this from my experience, I have had uh, different pale ales, American pale ales, where the flavor was spot on. The balance was just perfect, but it had a very light body and it just, the, the entire flavor just kind of dropped out and it did not deliver that experience. I, I referenced Led Zeppelin earlier uh, for when you, for those of you too young to remember Led Zeppelin, look them up on YouTube and it'll blow your mind. But it, you know, it would be to have one of these beers with a very, very light body. That's like having... Robert Plant and John Paul Jones and John Bonham playing. And then you've got me standing in for Jimmy Page and guitar. It just doesn't work. It's not the same. It's not even close. So you need to have a little bit of body for this beer to make it work. Uh, for carbonation, this can, the carbonation for this beer can actually get up there, which is kind of a good thing. Uh, it, it, it just gives it a little bit more food parability. It's a little bit more refreshing. It's a, it kind of gives you that impression of drying out. It makes you want to take another sip and it's just beautiful. Uh, this beer should also be smooth. No, no beer should ever be harsh, but especially this one, this should have this wonderful, beautiful, fresh hop presence. It shouldn't be harsh. It shouldn't be astringent. It should just, it should make you want to take another sip and another and another. Uh, so that is mouthfeel. Let's talk about style comparisons, Julia. Yes, sir. Mm -hmm. And I love it. Style comparison is going to take us to a place that actually um, helps us dial in because the American pale ale style does have kind of brothers, sisters, cousins that if in blind tasting, your brain has to really calibrate yeah. uh, with the experience of having, you know, that muscle or palate memory. So um, the biggest one that you would want to start with, because we said English uh, ales inspired the American pale ale, is the English um, pale ale or English bitters. Um, this is going to be usually the American pale ale lighter in color, um, less estery, less yeast, um, ale yeast kind of notes, and maybe a little less caramel, a little less um, specialty malt note, right? Crystal malt note. And then lots of overlap that this style really did inspire another style, American Amber Ale, which frankly is one of my top favorite styles. Mm -hmm. I might even like Amber Ale um, more than Pale Ale, scandal, but <laughs> it's true. And so what's the difference? Why do I like one over the other? 
you know, American pale ale compared to amber is the pale ale is going to be um, less caramely, less malt centric, um, a little less residual sugar and body and, um, you know, a little less centric on the, uh, the, the, the amber ale will be a little less centric on the hops and more malt and the pale ale is more about the hops and the malt. And I like that amber ale is starting these days to get more bitter to me. So they're, they're, they're two cousins and, and really good fun styles to try with each other. And then the style that we talked about that got inspired was the American IPA. And albeit we should know, if you don't, there's so many variants of IPA. Black IPA, red IPA, white IPA, rye IPA, Belgian IPA. Oh my gosh, I'm not going to go on. Hazy IPA. There are I many stop style casts right yet now. to come. <laughs> yes. But so when you order an IPA these days, it's gotten so muddy that, you know, if you're an old schooler, you need to start to say, I would like a non-hazy IPA. And you might get where you're, where I'm trying to take you right now, which is the American IPA. American IPA is classically um, not the hazy, juicy or hazy version. So back to American Pale Ale compared to American IPA, American Pale Ale is going to be less bitter, less alcohol, definitely, um, and less, uh, you know, weight and density and, and hop complexity than the American IPA. But the American IPA, think of it as the big brother or sister of the American Pale and then maltier and um, balanced and drinkable, less intensely hop focused and bitter than session strength IPAs. Uh, so that's a whole nother variant to think about. And then we do have a style cast on um, blonde ales. So this is going to be more bitter, more malty than a blonde ale. Yeah. And before I jump into commercial examples, I did want to add something. I, I'm surprised these are not on the list, but anyone who's studying this for BJCP test or particularly a Cicerone test, you have to taste these beers, but I recommend you put them side by side uh, with a German alt beer and a California common. Those, along with the, an American pale ale, those three beers are easy to get mixed up. I like it. And so, uh, so if you need to know this beer, uh, those, those, those other two beers, California common and German alt beer are probably the closest in my mind to this beer. So you need to know the, the differences. And, and we're really talking about a differences of uh, ingredients of flavor, but we're splitting hairs at this point. So that's, that's my advice if, uh, for those of you going after Cicerone and whatnot. Uh, but commercial examples. Uh, so obviously, Julia, uh, if you'll show your uh, can, we're talking about the Sierra Nevada Pale Ale. That's ground zero for American Pale Ales. Uh, another one that I have spent uh, a lot of time doing thorough research on myself as the Deschutes Mirror Pond in uh, Bend, Oregon. Uh, we've got Half Acre Daisy Cutter, Stone's Pale Ale, the Great Lakes uh, Burning River, uh, La Cumbre uh, Acclimated APA, uh, APA, American Pale Ale. Uh, for those of you who are going somewhere, there are a lot of really good American Pale Ales out there. They're classic. Uh, like I said, I found one in Pacific City, and it's fantastic. Uh, if you see that APA on a can or a bottle, well, that you can translate that. So these are easy, easy beers to find uh, to to study and to calibrate on. Uh, so that is commercial examples. Julia, will you take us through all the numbers? I'd be pleased to take us through these numbers, Jeremy. And part of the beer studies, if you're going to own your beer studies, you need to know the vitals for American Pale yeah. Ale. And so with that, um, generally, the beer uh, certification, beer judge certification program style guidelines uh, doesn't talk about Plato and alcohol by weight in, in European Brewing Convention, but I will list those as well. First and foremost, though, final gravity would be 1010 to 1015, um, which is going to reflect some residual sugar, right? Like it is. And so ABV or alcohol by volume based on that final gravity and the like is 4.5 to 6.2% or European Brewing Convention of, uh, uh, nope, not European Brewing Convention, alcohol by um, weight, which is different than alcohol by volume, and a little less, it's 3.5% to 4.3%. So you've got a beer that's sessionable, but it's, it can sneak up certain style examples to be a little more um, centric on ethanol. And then international bitterness units is a big one. I want to talk about um, BU to GU ratio in a second too, but international bitterness units is 30 to 50. I love the aspect of that. I believe Sierra Nevada is 45. Am I making things up? I haven't tested myself in a while. Um, and so it can go as high as 50. The reason I bring up a notion of BU to GU ratio is bitterness units to gravity units. And there's a formula. And basically, we are sensory creatures. We are not instruments, but we are instruments for what we perceive. 
And so the more residual sugar you have, the more a dance and a, it's a pairing of that sugar against the bitterness. Bitterness will buffer almost residual sugar. Sugar will lessen and buffer bitterness and they dance with each other. So the BU to G ratio for Sierra Nevada Pale Ale takes us to a number, and we should do a total prep episode on this, Jeremy, um, that shows us that it's balanced. It's literally one of, and Ray Daniels um, of the Cicerone program created the notion of BU to G ratio, that if it's above 0.5, it's um, less balanced and more towards bitter, less um, below 0.5, uh, then it is going to be uh, not as... Um, uh, more more balance and not as uh, overly tipping the scales to bitterness. So the amount of sugar matters in a beer. Total side note, but international bitterness units, pale ale, 30 to 50. If I quiz you, answer that, please. Then SRM st uh, standard reference method would be the color. Um, we've got five to 10, five starts at gold, 10 takes us up to copper. And then European Brewing Convention is eight to 14. And I definitely think pale ale, Sierra Nevada pale ale, and probably Jeremy's Pelican are right in the same area yeah. of getting towards amber to copper um, and not just dark gold. Uh, so those, um, fine sir, are some of the vitals. Well, and 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 if I, I'm going to respectfully add one quick correction, because I know I, I'm guilty of this, where I start riffing and I just say something, it just kind of flows Do it. out. Uh, you mentioned Correct away. you mentioned uh, ten gifts of copper. Copper is right around uh, fifteen, sixteen. Ten for me is just getting into light amber. Uh, just just for anyone listening and 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 keeping us uh, honest, making sure that we're yes. we're on our game. Uh, you know, yeah, I'm, I'm right there too. I want to make sure that we say it right. Uh, five to ten SRM we're we're talking uh to light amber so that's that's kind of really where we're going with this too well done yeah. thank you for the correction and that is an important one because i totally am remiss and i kind of was fudging and uh, I, I love it we hold each other accountable yeah well and you know it, we we have a lot of experience and knowledge in this stuff we have notes in front of us while we're recording these but we're also just having a conversation and, and sometimes we throw something out there where i'm thinking one thing and my mouth says another and uh and uh, and that's why sometimes i end up with a, a a mouth in the shape of a foot and so i want to make sure that we're we're making sure everything Thing is is right on this um but i'm just going to jump into glassware uh so the the i've got one right here the the glass that i'm used to seeing in this at most bars would be our shaker pint our it's really meant to be the top of of a metal shaker so we can make martinis and that and that sort of thing uh, it, it worked for American bars forever, and it's not the it's not the worst thing. The worst thing is not having a cup to put beer in, but it's definitely not the gla best glass for this either. I would much rather see something along the lines of a no neck pint that just allows a better uh, presentation of the flavor aroma, the foam, and has a better handhold where the glass holds onto my hand as much as I hold onto the glass. And there are other glasses that if you come to my house, I'm going to pour this beer in a different glass and I'll explain why. But really, uh, all we need is liquid to lips. And that's really the only important thing. Pour it in a red party cup. I don't care. Uh, but uh, I'm, I, I'm going to expect a shaker pint most of the time. Temperature wise, I do not want this beer from the bottom of the, of the uh, cooler. I do not want it at uh, refrigerator temps uh, at right about 38 degrees or 4 Celsius. I want this at 42, maybe 45 if I'm feeling a little, uh, you know, summery. Uh, that's kind of where I want this. I still want it to be cold. I just don't want it ice cold. Uh, there's a lot of flavor there that gets suppressed when we basically have this beer on ice. And please, anyone out there listening, do not serve this beer in a frosted glass. Do not ever, ever. And that's all I have to say about that. Let's talk about pairings. We should do a whole prepisode on uh, frosted glassware. Oh my gosh! I, got some thoughts. I could I could go on for an hour on that. Well, and just for anyone kind of to tease you, like try try licking the inside of your freezer, and see what you see what you like and don't right, like. It, how, All how right. Does it taste? <laughs> yeah, we'll we'll leave you with that thought. Um, pairings. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna just go for the go for the obvious. I want to pair this with the end of my workday. Yeah. I want to come home, crack a bottle or a glass take a pull off my kegerator draft, you know, keg system and, and drink a pint or two. It is, it is a beer that will go so well with so many foods to look to, you know, marry and bridge and complement with the pale malt and the um, cereal grains and the honey notes and light caramel and all that. And the low level tropical notes that, you know, the tangerine and clementine that uh, Cascade brings to us. 
But you know what? I just, I'm, I'm landed on, I want to pair this with the end of my work day because this is the beer where you would not displease anyone, including me, if I came home from a day where I just needed to decompress and you handed me this, that would have been the perfect pairing. Yeah. For me, I, I, I cannot think of, of a more perfect pairing than this beer style with a burger, with a slice of pepperoni pizza on a Friday at 5.05. Uh, uh, I've, I've had this with uh, Capicola uh, uh, meat. I've had this with H cheddar, sweet potato fries. This beer is fantastic with it. And, and I will share something with you, Julia. Um, you, know, I, I've, you know, I've had this with some really, I don't want spicy barbecue. I want some sweeter barbecue with this or like kind of like sweet, savory sausage is perfect with this. But I once did a beer pairing uh, dinner where we had this extremely talented uh, chef uh, come in and bring a dessert. It was made with, uh, I got to check my notes. It was a sweet potato cake with a pine nut and white chocolate whipped ganache and candied oranges. And, wow. and this beer, it, it, it blew my mind. I will never forget that pairing so long as I live. It, I, I, didn't, exp- I, I didn't know what I'd expect. I, I just thought, you know, this beer and dessert, no way. That sweet potato cake and all that stuff was mind-blowingly good. So, uh, so don't count out this beer style when it comes to dessert. It, uh, find those, find as you call them, those hooks. Uh, I, I think about those bridges. Find something that uh, that works. In this case, that candied orange just really, really resonated really well with that beer. And, and yeah, I see, worked. I see marmalades oh, and uh, candied absolutely. orange is a great one. Um, preserved uh, apricots. I see lots of of like kind of not red fruit, right? More more yeah. white skinned or light skinned fruit yeah. with this beer because of the hops. Yeah. This, I mean, Cascade hops are incredible to yeah, dive personal. into and get to know. But uh, but so for everyone listening, watching, please forgive us. This is a longer episode, but this is an important style. You have to know and appreciate and respect and love the style because. It, it, it is the the base of most everything else that we're working with around the world. So, so I hope you enjoy this. Cheers. Cheers. Thank you for listening to Essence of Beer Style, the essential beer style training for those who want to lead in food and beverage. With advanced Cicerones, me, Julia. And me, Jeremy. Tune into the next episode as we continue exploring the world of beer styles and what to make of them. We encourage you to listen to the prepisodes to build your foundation and better understand beer styles. And before the next episode, I'd like to ask you to review the show and let us know what you'd like featured in upcoming episodes. Until next time, here's to you and your sense of beer style. Thank you for listening. Cheers. Cheers.